So it has nothing to do with science. But. So how do you get rain? How do you get precipitation? Um, well, we talked about, um, gosh, was it in part th chapter 4, I think? In chapter 4, we talked about these things called cloud condensation nuclei, or CCN. That's the dust, the little pieces that kind of get water vapor started. But the thing about that is it's pretty small. So um, right after, wait a minute. I think they're pointing at this. You see this? You probably can't even see it. Okay, those two little things right there, that's what you get after when you first begin a, a cloud droplet. Okay, it's really small. Now, one of the things in order for cloud droplets to fall from the cloud, they have to get big enough because actually it's a gravity thing. If they're so small, they're too small to fall from the cloud. Okay? So we need to get something that small to go ahead and get bigger. Um, so how does that work? And actually, I'm going to talk you through a couple of different options. One is, is your cloud warm or is your cloud cold? Are you going to have ice crystals or is it all going to be liquid like that? Well, we're going to start with cold clouds. Okay. Um, cold might be... When I talk about cold, I'm talking about uh, freezing temperatures. So cold clouds, you should be thinking about snow. And one of the things I want to kind of convince you of is it's quite possible, even, I'm going to say in the summertime, that you have um, precipitation that falls as rain but started out as snow. Okay, I think that's kind of neat. But in order to talk about kind of the snow formation process, I need to introduce this concept of supercooled water. And you've probably seen it before. This will come up. Are you going to come up? Oh, it was until I clicked on it again. So have you ever like had bottled water in your car in the winter time and you go to open one up and it's liquid but then when you go to open it up it freezes on you? Okay, so that's what that is. It's super cooled. There's, there are super conditions in physical science. Super just means it's more than it should be. And actually we're going to talk about super saturated also. Supercooled means that it's cooler in its liquid state than it should be a solid. Supercooled water. Um, I think probably a better, let's see if this one has it. Hmm. Let's see what they do. He's telling you how to make super cold water. Along with the music. You should try this. You have to be very careful. You don't want to disturb it. Because if you disturb something that's in its super condition, it brings it out. Yeah, some of them will freeze, some are not frozen. And you grab the ones that are liquid and you try this. So all you got to do is disturb it and it comes out of its being a liquid and it freezes like it ought to. Called super cool water. Okay. <laughs> so that's actually what's going on in our clouds. Okay. 
So like inner clouds that are milky white, you know, be liquid, could be solid. But it also could be super cooled liquid water, right? So have you ever, if you've flown much or if you haven't flown much, um, they, before you take off, they de-ice your wings. Like, why are you de-icing my wings? It's not cold down here, okay? Basically, it's kind of like we saw those bottles going from liquid supercooled water to solid. When those planes fly through that supercooled liquid water, they're disturbing it, and right away it will come out and it will, like, on contact, freeze. Supercooled water. So the other day when we had a fog event and it was really cold, it was like, I think it's like 22 or something, not really cold, but 22 with fog. You're like, ooh, what does that look like? Well, it's probably super cool liquid water droplets, okay? And so on contact to something cool, it can go ahead and just turn into a layer of ice. All right, so that's what we got going on, super cool liquid water. And I'll try to sh convince you of how that works into making snow. So um, when I show you the making snow thing here in a minute, you're going to see that actually if you have water vapor, let's see how does it, water vapor. If you have water vapor, okay, the same amount of water vapor and you have um, liquid water and you have water ice, actually that same water vapor, or I should say, ice is what we call super saturated or more saturated. So here in a minute when I show you snow formation, you're more likely to get snow than you are water or liquid water at these temperatures. Okay, so if I ever asked you on a test what what is the overall name for making a snowflake, hopefully you'll say the per Bergeron process. The Bergeron process. Making snow. So what you're going to see on the next slide are a few figures. The first figure is basically going to be a little little seed of ice that is going to float through supercooled water. Okay? And that supercooled water is going to cling on to that ice crystal and make it grow into a snowflake, basically. Because it's super saturated. It's like what we saw, what, 120% saturated with regard to ice? And liquid, it's just 100%. Okay? So as it falls through, it's going to pick up that super saturated, um, excuse me, it's going to pick up the super cooled water because we have two supers here, right? Super cooled water, water's liquid, the, um, the cooler than the freezing point temperature, and we have super saturated, which basically is where it's over 100% um, relative humidity. Okay. So I don't know if you guys remember, but we used the word deposition or deposit for basically water going from a vapor right to a solid. That's deposition. And that's what happens to form snowflakes. Cute little snowflakes. So this is what it looks like, kind of from top to bottom. So you see you have your kind of little uh, snowflake seed, a little ice crystal that's falling through um, liquid, uh, super cooled liquid water droplets. Now those free Mickey Mouse things, okay, those are little water vapors. These guys right here, that's water vapors, okay, that actually are going to connect or deposit onto your ice crystal. But the cool thing here, no pun intended, is that as these go ahead and make your ice crystal bigger, then it lowers the relative humidity, so then actually you're going to see these super cooled liquid water droplets get smaller. So they're going to go ahead and feed the, the, sat, the saturated air. So if you compare the size of the little orbs, they got smaller. The ice crystal gets bigger, okay? They get smaller yet, the ice crystal gets bigger. Okay, so that's what we got. Those little blue things are super cooled liquid water. All right, Bergeron process. Um, so a little bit more about the whole snow thing. Um, the snow crystals, as they fall, are pretty delicate. They can break and actually then become seeds for new snow crystals. I know you've probably, uh, you know, seen them get larger. Some snowflakes are large, some snowflakes are smaller. And if you've ever heard, it kind of depends upon the temperature of the snow to get different kind of types of snowflakes. That's right. 
So here in a minute, I'm going to try to kind of give you some, some options for is the snow going to make it to the ground as snow or is it going to melt to give us rain? Or actually these last two, freezing rain and sleet, they kind of go together. So Bergeron process is the making of snow, formation of snow that I just kind of described. But like I said, um, a lot of times, even though it's raining here, it starts out as snow. So after we talk about this whole cold clouds, these are cold clouds, we're going to talk about warm clouds. I'm going to switch it up a little bit. Okay, so I have four figures to show you to, sh to say, well, what's going to happen here at the ground? Okay, right here. What is our precipitation going to be? So the way you read this is over here, I like this, this is freezing and this is melting. Okay, so basically if it's in the blue, it's frozen. If it's in the pink, it's melted. So in this scenario, we end up with rain, okay? That makes sense. It starts out with the Bergeron process up here. I'll go ahead and put a B, Bergeron process. It falls, it melts, we get rain. That makes sense. And in this case, we get snow. Because notice in this case, actually, our temperature clear down to the ground, you know, is right at or colder than freezing. So it snays cute little snowflakes. Makes sense. So that just leaves um, sleet and freezing rain to worry about. So now take a good look at this. Take a good look at this. That actually, we talked about what does the temperature doing as you're going up in elevation. So as you go up in elevation, notice it's getting colder, right? As you go up in elevation, it's getting colder. All right. Well, check this one out. This one has a kink. So up here, I'm kind of focusing on this for now. Up here, that is as you go up in elevation, it gets colder, right? But right here, this down here, this is as you go up in elevation, it gets warmer. This right down here is what we call, and I've talked about it before, this is what we call a temperature, T-E-M-P for temperature inversion. The word inversion means like backwards, and that is backwards. As you go up in elevation, it gets warmer. So what can happen then is you already see kind of the problem here is if I just focus on this right here, oops, if I focus on this right here, this means basically it was cold enough, you know, Bergeron process gave us snow, over here it melted, and then over here it's going to freeze again. So temperature inversion gives us those other two. Temperature inversion gives us sleet, and the temperature inversion gives us freezing rain. Okay, now, which one we get depends upon what we say, how deep that temperature inversion is. Okay, in this case, that temperature inversion was pretty high. That meant that it had a fair bit in this cold region to go ahead and pelletalize. Sometimes they call this ice pellets now. Ice pellets, I was talking to my husband about this. He's like, no, they're not the same thing. Yes, they are the same thing. Ice pellets and sleet, they're the same thing. Okay, basically, it started out as snow, okay, it melted, and it refreezed, okay, but it needs a certain depth. So sleet and ice pellets, right? So compare that depth with this depth now, okay? I know it's a subtle thing, but that depth was up here, okay, and this one is here. So that means right here, that's where you get your chance to freeze. It's not very deep at all. Okay, so that's where you're going to get your freezing rain. Freezes on contact, nasty stuff. Do not drive in freezing rain. Tell a girl that. Okay. I've heard freezing rain and glaze actually used synonymously, the word glaze. Um, but does that make sense? Yeah. So you, I think you have a homework question to kind of say what sort of temperature do we have going on to give us rain, to give us snow, to give us um, sleet. Now, one of the things I'm going to try to convince you of, but it's also in this chapter, in chapter 5, is hail. You can only get hail from storm clouds, okay? Even though sleet looks like little baby hail pieces, okay? Sleet is like this, okay? 
All right. So I like this figure. This figure actually combines them all. Oh my gosh. So if you look at the pink where the pink have been, I'll just put an um, H, we have it or W for warm. The pink is warm and um, um, and then we have it cold up here, obviously. So depending upon, you know, the three things we looked at, this will give you a rain, okay? This right here, we have a temperature inversion right there. Um, and this is giving us uh, not enough time for, actually, this is freezing rain. This is relatively shallow. Here we have a temperature inversion also, but it's relatively deep. We have time for it to pelletize, and that gives us our sleet, okay? And then over here, it's basically cold all the way down. Um, we're, how do I say this? Um, it's, it is very, it is possible to actually have a warm chunk of air like this kind of go up, ride, what we call ride, literally R-I-D-E, ride kind of up and over this cold, dense air like this and to bring precipitation. And you've just definitely created a temperature inversion. So there's, I like it. That's a good figure. Okay. So again, you know, um, yeah. You know, sometimes it makes it it makes a good test question. You know, what do freezing rain and sleet have in common? What they have in common is that the temperature going up in the troposphere. You need to have a temperature inversion. So that does not look good. <laughs> that looks like freezing rain, freezing on contact. Not good. Okay. Okay, so that was cold clouds. And actually, I think I have a slide coming up. If somebody says, I don't have a cold cloud, I have a cool cloud, well, then actually kind of think of it starting out as snowflakes and kind of ending as kind of this other process like a warm cloud. But I want to talk about warm clouds now. So warm clouds um, are more year-long around the equator. These will be your warm clouds. So even high up in the cloud, it's not cold enough to make snow, not cold enough for the Bergeron process. So instead of the Bergeron process, you see it in bold. This, this process creating rain droplets from warm clouds is called collision coalescence. Now we talked about different, two different types of cloud condensation nuclei the other day. We talked about the ones that love the cloud condensation nuclei that love to get the party started, okay? And those were water-loving, hygroscopic. Okay, so in a warm cloud, I'm going to kind of talk you through it. But one of the things about falling rain is it, it, it comes to, I want to talk about how fast those rain particles fall. So if you're familiar with this concept of terminal velocity, terminal or fall velocity, Basically, one of the things a long time ago um, Galileo first found and then Newton uh, supported, if you drop something, like if I drop this pen, it should go faster and faster and faster. I know it looks like it's going the same speed, but if I were to clock it down there, it's going faster than when I first dropped it. So it's supposed to go faster and faster and faster, like 9.8 meters per second every second it falls. But on Earth... The thing, the reason that isn't the case is because Earth has air, and air creates um, a drag, just like this says. So if I pick on my pen again, okay, the the ultimate max out velocity is the what we call the terminal velocity. It will max out, and and it's based upon a little bit its mass, a little bit its aerodynamics, okay. So what we have here in a minute is basically kind of a series of different little liquid water droplets falling, free-falling, gravity's pulling them down, okay, and they're going to fall at different rates. And what we're going to see is that the heaviest one has the, has the greatest terminal velocity, okay. The lightest liquid water droplets, even though they're supposed to keep accelerating, drag comes into play and they have a smaller terminal velocity. Okay, that's it. So little liquid water droplets are falling more slowly, even though they should both accelerate at the same, same rate. All right. So this actually is kind of showing you that. So as you increase in size, 
okay, you increase in how fast they're falling. And if you've ever gotten hit by a, you know, a big old water droplet, I mean, they can be looking, okay, they can be falling at, I guess we're most used to the English terms, 14 to 20 miles per hour, your little liquid water droplets that make it to the earth, is their final term. Um, so, and remember that um, kinetic energy is a function of how much, how much or their impact will be related to their velocity and their mass. Anyway, okay, so let's go back to the collision coalescence process that's working to make our, our rain droplets. So in order for, um, and we'll be talking more about this kind of gentle updraft. Let me put this whole thing up here. Okay, one of the things in, I don't know, it might be unit three in here, maybe it's unit two, I guess it's probably, I mean, I think it is unit three. One of the things we're going to talk about is that actually if this is my earth surface, okay, we have an ongoing, and it's not a strong wind or anything, but we have an ongoing kind of what we call an updraft. And it is kind of, a, I think of it as kind of a gentle freeze going up vertically all the time. Related to this, and we'll talk about this more uh, next week, related to high pressure and a low pressure we have. So it needs to be big enough to basically overcome this updraft. So how does it get big enough? Well, it gets big enough through colliding and coalescing, collision coalescence process. So here we go, collision. So basically what we're going to see is that there is a, um, a large drop, a large droplet, we call the collector droplet, and it is going to fall fastest through our assortment of sizes of liquid particles. It's going to fall, call fast, fall fastest, and it's going to run into the slow little ones, and it's going to gobble them up. Kind of. Okay. So, um, but there's a catch. There's always a catch. Just even at the level that we're looking at, I'll put all these up here. If you've ever um, tried to, if there's like a feather falling in your like, or a piece of lint or something falling through the air, it's just kind of falling nice and slow, and you're like, dang it, I'm going to get that feather. It bothers me. When you reach out to try to get that feather, it scoots away from you, okay? Because what you've done basically to reach out, we'll be talking more about this, but, well, you're creating a wind. You're kind of fanning it away. You're creating a hot, what we call a high pressure in front of your palm, and it's scooting the, that darn thing that you wanted to get away from you. Okay? And so actually there's a little bit of that as, as what we call the collector droplet falls through, and it wants to gobble up the slower, the little slower moving ones. It actually also creates a little high pressure in front of it, just like when you go to reach that feather. You can't get it. So also we have kind of that same issue with your collector droplet. But there is some successful collisions, and... To coalesce means to come together. So there, there are some successful gobbling up of that collector droplet with the little ones. Okay. So this kind of talks you through it. Basically, in a warm cloud, in a warm cloud, we don't have the Bergeron process at all. Okay. It just kind of starts with a collector droplet falling faster than the little smaller ones and gobbling them up. Collision coalescence. And so that's kind of what you see here. Collision coalescence. You can see the granddaddy falling through there. But what can happen sometimes is basically, and I've seen a video where basically they show it kind of oscillating, and they don't look like, a, they look like a donut kind of. They're kind of squished in the middle, okay? Um, what can happen is they can actually get to kind of flopping too much, and they break apart, which depending upon the size they break apart into, then you got a whole other, other set of collector droplets. So that's kind of the phenomenon that's happening um, for your, in your clouds, your warm clouds. Collision coalescence. Okay, so cold clouds, Bergeron process. Cool clouds, basically at the top part you have snow, and then at the bottom of the cloud you have temperatures that are warmer than freezing, so you probably have the collision coalescence process. So we have cold, cool, and warm. Makes sense. Okay. 
So a few little miscellaneous things. So um, it's funny because precipitation only counts if it reaches the ground. So you may have um, seen this phenomenon before. These are not precipitation. Um, this, I believe, is Virga. And this, I believe, is false streaks. Basically, for both of them, the precipitation does not reach the ground. Um, and there's a, te there's a question in your homework, your last question in your homework. It says, um, well, first off, why doesn't it reach the ground? And it goes back to kind of like condensation trails we were talking about. If this air is dry, okay, if this air is dry, it starts to rain, okay, but it basically evaporates back into the dry air. Here, the air again is dry. It starts to snow, but instead of reaching the ground, it evaporates back into the air. Okay, so that only happens in dry air. And what your homework question says is, why wouldn't you have fog and why wouldn't you have fog and Virga the same kind of atmospheric conditions? Because fog requires high humidity, Virga requires low humidity. That's the answer to that one. So here are some uh, kind of an assortment of different precipitations. Okay, we talked about these. We haven't talked about all of them. We're going to talk about rime, hail, and grapple coming up. Okay, so a little bit about snow. Snow, because it comes from water, you know, snow is solid water. Water has this sort of kind of six-sided thing going on with it when it bonds to other water molecules. And so our ice crystals, our, our liquid solid crystals, our solid water crystals also have a six-sided thing going to them. Okay, so you guys have run into this before. Um, if you have cold conditions, you're gonna actually get kind of small little snowflakes. And if you have kind of warm, warm snow, then they'll be larger. Maybe it's more aggregation. So I snagged this from the internet. You see the kind of the different temperatures and kind of the different snow or ice crystal. Snow is beautiful. I'm just saying. So I hope I, I hope we're kind of dividing enough the whole other precipitating. I told you that hail only comes from storm clouds. Hail only comes from storm clouds. We talked about two types of, of clouds that give us precipitation. One is a storm cloud and one is what we call just nimbostratus, gives us precipitation. Cumulonimbus gives us precipitation, but it's a storm cloud. So the thing about hail and the storm cloud, and we're, you know we're going to spend um, a whole chapter talking about storm clouds. But uh, storm clouds have what we call a strong updraft. Okay, that's what makes them so crazy. And then the downdraft of any cloud, actually if it's precipitating, is the downdraft is going to bring your precipitation. So how we get hail in a storm cloud has to do with our updraft and our downdraft. If you kind of follow that little hailstone, it'll, the hailstone will take an updraft, Okay. We talked about super cool water in here. Basically, you have a nubbin of something that, that goes up and through the super cooled water, and it, and it uh, adds a layer. So it gets bigger. It gets big enough, heavy enough to fall down. It catches another updraft. It gets another layer on it, okay, and then it falls down. It catches another updraft. It gets another layer on it of super cooled water. And so a lot of times, hailstones will kind of have this layer on them how many times they went up. So they only come from storm clouds. So the updraft and the downdraft associated with the cumulonimbus cloud. All right. So rime. Rime is what I call fancy frost. Rime is just fancy frost. Doesn't look like fancy frost. Um, 
So the other day when we had the fog event and it was like 22 out, I don't know if you noticed, but if you looked over, because I was um, driving past, um, I don't know what creek that is, but down by the Siemens, you know, and they have trees over there, and they were like all nice and white and pretty, okay? What happened was that fog harbored super cooled water, as far as I could tell. And it's that deposition that gives you this fancy frost. I think that's cool. Now there's... There's rime and then there's hoarfrost. And I actually post it on my Twitter feed because they look similar, but they're different. Okay, measuring rain, and then actually we're going to talk about measuring snow a little bit. But measuring precipitation, you have some options. I always think it's kind of kind of cool. I guess I am impressed by farmers who actually call into, um, like, um, meteorologist news people and give their rainfall amounts and I think that's pretty cool um, and they probably have a simple rain gauge or standard rain gauge tipping bucket rain gauges are great um, if you like have one of those automatic those ASOS's over by the airport and you want to measure precipitation amounts but you don't want to tend to it that's a possibility um, our weighing gauge. So I have some pictures of each one of those. Kind of from left to right, we increase in sophistication. The standard rain gauge actually has a funnel, and then it um, its gradations then don't need to take into account that it's taking a large volume into a smaller volume. Um, the C, the tipping bucket gauge, is something that can go ahead, fill, dump, fill, dump, and then it um, counts how many dumps it had to, to see how much uh, rain it took in. This one actually see you can actually melt uh, snow and get um, uh, equivalents um, from snow. And then this one, okay. So the whole how much precipitation did we get could be kind of problematic if we've got wind kind of uh, involved. It can, but usually these will all give you kind of bias low. So maybe all you need to do is just add on a percentage or so beyond what you lost. Okay, so measuring snow. Um, there are some options here to measuring snow. But as you already know, um, if somebody says, how many inches of snow did you get? You're like, well, where do you want me to measure it? <laughs> you know, especially if there's any wind at all. You're like, dude, I have no idea. Um, so instead of that, what you can do, or kind of relates to that, is take your snow and go ahead and reduce it down to liquid and give water equivalents. This is kind of neat. I think uh, a, a difference between this edition of your textbook and the previous edition is they didn't talk about this. These are snow pillows. So basically, there is a, uh, a weight measuring device underneath there. So because you know snow has weight, right? <laughs> So then, um, however much weight it is, they can kind of they can use um, the conversion for um, you know the density of liquid water and get a water equivalence that way. So, and your textbook says the reason they might want to do this is because snowfall is very important to like uh, mountainous regions to get their actually their fresh water. So, um, okay. So measuring precipitation indirectly, that would be this, okay? So for you weather buffs out there who um, have kind of looked at maps, this map might look familiar. This is your precipitation map. Um, and the way they get this information is by using radar. So basically they send out a signal, and if the signal does not come back, there's no precipitation. If the signal hits precipitation, then it's called an echo. It will return, and they can measure the amount of the echo. The more precipitation there is, the more the signal comes back. So then they can translate that into an intensity. Um, as I understand it, though, um, honestly, there's a good chance that this kind of northeast kind of radar information you're looking at came from a lot of different radars, like collectively sending in their information to be used. Because a radar has a limitation. Um, that's actually for spotter training. If you go and to do severe weather and learn the symptoms of severe weather and something to call into the National Weather Service, 
radar is so limited that um, they could have rotation, but they don't have the radar to see the rotation. Okay, uh, hills, especially in this region, in the way or something like that. So, um, anyway, so radar is an indirect indication of uh, precipitation. Okay, so finishing up. Um, weather modification sounds like science fiction. Actually, <coughs> it's probably gone because, you know, if you have Netflix at home, um, Netflix uh, movies kind of cycle on and off. But they used to have, it's been a couple years ago, like a documentary on weather modification. It was very interesting. Um, the problem with weather modification is, like, say you're looking at a globe and and this region needs precipitation and this ne region needs precipitation but like if this one basically snags it from the air with cloud seeding is actually is a is a real possibility snags the precip with cloud uh, seeding then this guy over here is out out of luck so there is some uh, and I'm sure there's been uh, it makes for great movies uh, that sort of thing but we can modify the um, the weather by actively using energy, we can um, just modify it like making something dark light or something that was light dark. Um, cloud seeding is um, actively triggering an event. So cloud seeding's been around a long time. This actually, you can see this, this is a uh, photo from your textbook. You can see these little jets back out here where they probably are gonna spit carbon dioxide to kind of try to stimulate the, um, the cloud formation process. Um, so its results kind of questionable. Um, but like I say on the slide, it's interesting how, I mean, we know how clouds form to a certain extent, why we don't have it entirely figured out, but ethics is an issue. Um, hail. Okay, I went ahead and uh, still included this semester. This is like an old um, noise generator. It doesn't look like they're trying to... There's a snake oil salesman down there. <laughs> okay, so up above that actually is a picture of why you would worry about hail. You know, hail falling at the wrong time can basically devastate a farmer's income for the season. Um, but I don't, you know, controlling hail, that's definitely not something we can necessarily do. Um, remember, though, hail only falls from storm clouds. Um, okay, last slide. So um, we haven't had it for a while. Maybe it's because of global warming. Uh, just kidding, sort of. But you know those frost warnings down in Florida that make the price of citrus go up? <laughs> okay. Um, this is all just a slide about how could you kind of modify the conditions that your fruit are seeing in order to save your fruit. We have a couple of options. The first one is kind of a fan to try to kind of bring warm air down. Um, this one right here, these smudge or whatever, or trying to kind of create a smoke to try to make a blanket uh, so the outgoing radiation at night will not go away. This one's pretty desperate. This last one is actually you take your fruit and you sprinkle it with liquid water, knowing that when liquid water freezes, it releases a little bit of heat. So, um, oh, I'm going to take just a minute, and it won't take very long, but here is the problems that are due. I didn't do it last time. Um, next week when we meet, they look like this. Okay. So here's the first, there's five questions. This is the first one. This one has an asterisk. Yep, number two has an asterisk. So simply tell me which clouds um, are associated with each one of these. I think you can do fine with that. Okay, the next uh, two are five and eight, and five and eight, you have to use complete sentences. Okay, why does radiation fog form mainly on clear nights as opposed to cloudy nights? 
Well, clear nights means that you can go ahead and cloud, cool down over the night. If it's cloudy, that's it's not going to cool down, and you need it to cool down for radiation fog. Um, number eight, describe or sketch. So I guess if you sketch, you would not have to use complete sentences. So number eight, I know I don't have an asterisk, but feel free just to sketch it, and then you don't have to use complete sentences. So how do you get snow? Well, of course, it stays cold the whole way down. How do you get rain? Well, it was cold, and then it melts. And then freezing rain, it basically was cold, melts, and then refreezes. Oh, yep, next one. Last. Okay, uh, this one. Uh, use this diagram. Changes. Um, which show changes in temperature and the dew point temperature with altitudes to complete the following. Okay. So the dew point temperature is the blue. Okay. And then the red is the current temperature. And where you see them intersect, okay, to me, that's where you have condensation. Does that make sense? Okay, so the red ones are the current temperature, and the blue ones are the dew point temperature. And where they intersect, you have condensation. So at what altitude would clouds be found? And it gives you choices uh, 0 to 4, 4 to 8, or 8 to 12. And I'm kind of thinking 4 to 8. Does that seem right to you? Yep. Um, B, um, what would cloud consist of? Liquid droplets, ice crystals, or both liquid and ice? Well, then you're looking at the temperature, aren't you? What is the temperature there? Uh, looks like negative 20 to 0. So probably, I don't know. I probably would take ice crystals only or both liquid would be super cold. I'd probably take the one there. And the last one, if the cloud produced precipitation, what will likely would reach the earth? So then you got to focus on what the temperature is. Because I'm kind of like in a, you figure, those are in Celsius. So, I mean, I don't see how it could be rain, do you? I mean, it's always to the cool side of, of zero Celsius. So, I think, you know, I, I'm thinking snow, because I don't even see how it can melt. Do you? I mean, I don't mean to do your homework for you. Since we're there. <laughs> then the last one was this one, the whole um, Virga. Remember a little bit ago I said actually Virga is where it evaporates before it hits the ground. And the reason it does that is because the air is dry. Okay, and then fog is just the opposite. Fog has what high um, relative humidity. And so those are at odds. These cannot both happen. Make sense. Cool. Well, dang. We'll play hooky for Friday. Okay. Let me know if you have any questions, and otherwise, keep looking up.